Welcome into the CHGO White Sox podcast coming to you live from Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Alongside me, Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him at ExtraWall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. Vinny is still doing his job. Uh, he's just not here today. Uh, he's out at the Boys and Girls Club event mm-hmm. uh, where the White Sox are currently participating. Uh, Scott Merkin had a, f- a group photo, uh, and uh, it was cropped in our Discord and sent uh, for me uh, to show Andrew Benatendi, who apparently has a new weight training program that I can't hear. Uh, wait to hear all about it. Uh, but yeah, oh, Pedro. God. He's going to be the best shape of his life again? I th- he might be. Uh, Pedro's there. Uh, you got Nicky Lopez there. Uh, Nick Nestrini, Jake Eater, I believe Brian Ramos, uh, Andrew Benatendi, Paul DeYoung. This is the chopped off uh, photo that uh, Husky Bardo sent. I don't know who's emceeing this event, um, but they're blocking somebody. Uh, and I'm not sure who's to the left of or to the right of Nicky Lopez. So that's fun. Uh, a lot of young guys. Yes. And that's your sick- season ticket holder event. Uh, because it's Colson Montgomery and uh, Yohan Moncada were delayed by weather. Uh, I, I assume that's weather. the group that's going to be going there on Friday. Weather. To the Field Museum. <laughs> it's not that bad outside. Come on now. What, is it because a little foggy? Well, come, come I mean, now. to be fair, they might. Well, I don't know if it was weather. It was traveling delays. I don't know. Okay. That, that was my bad. I'm not a reporter. Please don't listen to me. It is a um, little scary out with all the fog. It's fine. Waylaid by travel delays, mm. which is, I don't know. One of my favorite groups, Travel don't, with the Lace. Don't shoot the messenger. Uh, on today's episode, we'll be talking about the brand new play-by-play announcer, John Schifrin. Yeah, you said it. Yeah? Yeah. You, yeah. Said, you said it's Griffin I, with the S-C-H. It's, it's Griffin with a sh in, in front of it. Uh, I'm not confident on the name. He's from ESPN, uh, started being a play-by-play announcer in 2020, started with uh, Korean baseball organization games, uh, and then also did some college football and college basketball. Prior to that, worked with CBS Sports Network, uh, doing some play-by-play, to be fair, uh, on college basketball, but then also uh, sideline reporting, working mm-hmm. his way up. And then before that, he was with ABC7 News, or not ABC7 News, uh, ABC News yep. as a reporter. And I watched a report on the Cool Ranch Doritos Locos Taco from uh, Mr. Schriffen. Uh See, it doesn't it doesn't sound right coming out of the mouth. It's fine. I mean, he'll correct Shriffin. if we ever get him on the air. We'll correct. He'll correct us if he needs to. But yeah, I think um, out of the three guys, of course, I was rooting for Connor. Um, but they see him as too green, and that's understandable because he really hasn't done major league TV at all, except for their broadcast when they're substituting in for Jason Benetti. The other two guys, uh, the Red Sox guy, uh, Will Fleming, I would have been a, probably the most the name I knew the most from a national perspective. I know of John Schriffen from his ABC days. I used to watch some Good Morning America, and once in a while I'll see him. I'm like, okay, cool. Never thought that that guy could be the White Sox play-by-play guy. But, you know, if the White Sox feel like this guy is the guy, I will give him a chance. And it's going to be really hard for him, though. A hundred percent hard because you're replacing a legend and a very beloved figure in Jason Benetti. And you're the guy who's an outsider, firstly, as a Chicago, and you know outsiders don't work too well in this town. You need to be, you know, knowing of the city. And as Tom points out, he doesn't even know the food yet. So, you know, first thing he'll do is put ketchup on his hot dog and then some jerk will say, oh, you don't put ketchup in your hot dog in Chicago. These things will be minor, but if he does a good job with the play-by-play, after a while, most people will forget about his being an outsider and just be like, that's our guy, John Schriffen. We love him. Yeah. As you said, out of the final three, I think it would be the coolest, personally, for Connor to be it. But I also kind of thought he was too green. I never... I mean, just as you bring up, uh, John Schifrin might not sound like the White Sox play-by-play announcer. If you also told me that, you know, 2019 when Dan Bernstein and Connor uh, McKnight were putting together shows that Connor would be the TV TV, uh, TV uh, play-by-play announcer, I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, Connor's a great guy, uh, oh. very talented at his job, but just never, <laughs> never thought that he'd jump from, uh, you know, what, 10 to 2 on the score to, to play-by-play with the Sox. I thought Fleming made the most sense because he has baseball experience, or at least Major League Baseball experience. The thing that I don't like, and it's obviously unfair, and we're going to play a 12-minute Zoom from John, and he'll 
you'll get to meet him. You'll get to learn more about him. Um, in that first video that they did post, like, you know, yeah. your first impression is your le- last impression. And, you know, you bring up the food thing. Uh, and he said the most, two most important things to me are my dog and food. Yes. I don't, I, the word basic is overused, but Herb, do you like food and water? Oh, it's one of my favorite things. I, mm, I just, you know. <laughs> They're most, my, most you kind of need it to live there, Johnny boy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I get liking your dog, but I, I don't know. There's something that just didn't pop with me. Uh, should we watch the Zoom and see if anything pops with us? Hopefully, because, yeah, as you said, that was not a good look for him. And as I put on my Twitter, first look at him, I was like, we're getting Nick Magical? Well, what the hell it, happened? Sarah flashed the graphic, yeah. I mean, the Cubs podcast uh, said it. We got some twinsies. Uh, John Schifrin and Nick Magical looking alike. I mean, Magical sets himself apart with the beard. <laughs> yes, of <laughs> course. And the uh, two home runs he hit last year. John hit zero. Yes, right. <laughs> so so uh, John uh, was a former pitcher. So, hey, maybe, you know, John could strike out Madrigal. Uh, uh, I, it'll be hard to do because, you know, his name is Nicky Two Strikes. Loser, uh, loser, leave Chicago. Uh, all right. Uh, let's hear from, uh, I was going to call him Johnny something, but I, I really couldn't be that. Johnny Two Calls? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. No. Doesn't. Here's John Schifrin uh, answering Cheryl Ray Stout's question on, you know, becoming the White Sox broadcaster. Why is it at this time the right time for you to do a play by play of a team like the White Sox? I have always wanted to be in the big leagues from when I was a little kid. My dream was always to be a major league baseball player. And so to be able to get here eventually as a broadcaster is really coming full circle for me. The White Sox specifically is very exciting for me just because of where the organization is. I mean, when you look at what Jerry has done for this organization, He's a guy who lives, breathes, sleeps baseball. And when I met with Jerry this past weekend, uh, it was exciting to learn and just feel his passion for the team and just how the history of baseball and how much he loves it and our shared passion for it. Uh, So the timing is right for me because I have done so many things in the course of my career in broadcasting. Um, And the next step for me is to join a team, get to know the team better, and really join a Uh, a community and move to Chicago. Have you dug into this fan base, which is really, really tough on everybody? I have. And I think that's the most exciting part because the thing that I've noticed is the passion. And that's all you can ask for when you have a a job like this. Yes. I'm going to be the face of the broadcast along with Steve stone, who's legend. And I'm going to lean on Steve a ton because everybody knows Steve in this market, but I'm excited about that. And I think that's all you can ask for as a broadcaster is for the interest to be there, is for the passion to be there. And what I can tell fans is that I'm going to match that passion. I am super excited about baseball, about learning Chicago, about this White Sox club that is forming together with all the young stars that are here. And uh, give some time. And I think you guys are going to enjoy what you see on TV. From uh, CHGO, Vinny Duber. Hey, John, welcome to Chicago. Uh Kind of a uh, you know a question that might sound kind of big, but kind of how do you look at baseball and and kind of what are the things about baseball that you like to kind of come out in your broadcasts? So what's exciting about baseball is that you have time to talk and tell stories. And I, I think I cover a lot of different sports: football, basketball, baseball. But what makes baseball so different is just the length of the game and the ability to have conversations with your analysts. And I think that's what excites me the most. And when you work with a legend like Steve Stone who has been and seen everything in the game. I think he has such a unique perspective. And for me, the way I look at this job is that I just want to be his point guard. I want to set him up. I want to pull things out of him. I want to put him in the best positions. And I hope that with our broadcast, fans can just take away one thing or learn one thing about the game or about the team every single broadcast. And I think that's why I can lean on Steve to do that. And that's what baseball provides. It gives us the ability to tell the time with the time. Chicago fans have, you know, they're known for having pretty good relationships, close relationships with their broadcasters. What is kind of the first thing that you want them to know about you uh, as you kind of start to build your relationship with White Sox fans? I approach my broadcasting like a fan. So you're going to feel the way you probably feel at home. I don't hide my emotions. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'm an emotional guy. So when there's a big play, you're going to feel it. You're going to hear it in my voice. If something goes bad, you're going to be like, oh, you're going to know. 
And I think that's what my style has been. People can always recognize the energy and the passion and also just being prepared. I think that's the something that people can never deny about my broadcast is that I'm always going to be prepared for the game. And I always have my knowledge because that comes from my news background. When I go into any game, I always want to make sure I know everything that's going on and prepare. And maybe 10% of that information gets into a broadcast, but I need to be ready to go wherever the game may take it. And I just want to make sure that I have the ability to do that. From the Chicago Sun-Times, Jeff Agress. Thank you, John. Congratulations. Uh, a couple of questions. How many games will you be calling for the Sox on television? And will you be staying with ESPN either during the season or during the off season? Yeah. So right now I plan on calling the majority of the games. So we don't have an exact number, but I want to be the voice and face of the Chicago White Sox broadcast. Um, and the goal is to be there throughout September. So it was very clear. And that's something I talked with Jerry early on is that whoever he hired, he wanted to make sure that that person, this was going to be their main priority. And I said, I'm very clear on that. And so that's the agreement we had very early on in this process. And that's the understanding that we have. And will you still remain with ESPN in the off season? That's the goal right now, but I mean, still working through things. I mean, everything has happened so fast at this point. Um, so I would love to still stay at ESPN in the off season and still do other sports. Um, but right now I'm still trying to, I still have games left with ESPN for college basketball. So everything's kind of happening fast. So I have games I'm wrapping up with ESPN. I've got preparing for spring training, preparing to find a place in Chicago. So a lot happening right now. Have you talked about with anyone um, what it's like calling baseball for six months? You know, the everyday grind of being the daily play-by-play -play announcer for a team. Have you been given any insight as to what that experience is like? Sure. And, and you know, I cover Major League Baseball games for ESPN Radio. So I talk to broadcasters every time I go to a ballpark and I understand what it means to have to call every single game. And for me... I don't look at it as a grind. I look at it as an opportunity because the more you're around a team, the more you get to know them. Like that's why I want to get to spring training early because I, there's so many new faces on this team that I want to be able to understand and know who they are at a deep level so that I can have that explanation and be able to introduce them to the fans so that the fans have an understanding of who they are. So I don't see it as a grind. I see it as let's go. Here's a chance to really get to know an incredible team. John, uh, which uh, which team did you grow up watching, and and what are kind of some of the the memories that stick out to you in terms of like you know like you said you're getting excited when you when a big moment happens. What's kind of a big moment that sticks in your memory? Uh, so I like old school broadcasters, like the Giants win the pennant, the Giants, you know, like I I I like those calls. Um, Red Barber, I, I think Red Barber, the the six calling number sixty one, the home run. I think so. Like Red Barber's call, something that six sucks out for me was, it was so simple the way he set up the pitch, um, and the way the fans were kind of booing because it, it was I think it was like a two zero count leading up to the the home run, but when the ball went into the stands, Red did a great job of noticing what was happening. There was a fight in the out in the stands for the ball, and I think he said something to the effect of. $5,000 to whoever caught the ball. And, and my style is say what you see, you know, what is actually happening on the field in the stands? What are people seeing at home and really talking to that and not having a prepared call. And I think that's more my style, like the old school broadcasters who were just very simple to the point and just let fans know like what's going on. From the Chicago Tribune, Paul Sullivan, go ahead, Sully. Uh, hi, uh, John. Congratulations. Um, have you talked to Jason at all? And uh, do you know do you know him well? And what can you uh, learn from from his experience here? Uh, I actually don't know him at all. I don't have a relationship with him. I know he's an incredible broadcaster, um, so I haven't had any kind of conversation or connection to him. Yes, please. Um, okay, go ahead. I'm curious. Oh, thank you, uh, John. If you, um, what your conversation with Steve Stone. I, I, which I assume you've you've talked to so far um, was like, and and what you were what your impressions of him were for what your working relationship will be like. Sure. Um, so I had the, a great opportunity to meet with Jerry and Steve in Phoenix this past weekend, um, and it was funny because Jerry actually told me, "All right, get in my car," and he drove me over to meet Steve at the restaurant. <laughs> so that was a great experience. Um, 
so Steve, we were only supposed to meet for maybe like half an hour, an hour. And it turned into a three hour dinner. Like me and Steve oh. hit it off, off the bat. And what I wanted to know was 1980, you know, like his magical year. What was it about 1980? And I think everyone can relate to that because we all hope and dream to have that one moment in our life where everything just kind of comes together. Right. And hearing him talk about his process, what led up to it, what it was like experiencing it and then coming out of it and leading into his broadcast career. Uh, that was probably the highlight of the conversation for me. Just, just hearing his story and his process. Well, where was this? Was this in, what city was this in? Uh, so we met with, in his home in Scottsdale. Okay. We went out to Thank dinner you. there. Yeah. John, what were some of the questions they asked you about broadcasting? Uh, so they wanted to know, first off, my commitment. That was a big thing off the bat. They wanted to know, obviously, I have a national platform at ESPN where they wanted to know what kind of commitment I was willing to make to the White Sox. And I said, I am all in. I said, if I'm the guy, I'm going to be all in. Uh, they wanted to know my process, how I prepare for games, uh, yeah. my style in terms of interacting with players. Um, and I told them that I draw on my other experience in broadcasting. So I have a, a career in news. And even in sports, I was a sideline reporter before becoming a play-by-play. -play. So I have a way of, I know how to talk to people. I know how to get information out of people, but also do it in a respectful way. And then I should know, I showed them that, you know, as a sideline reporter, you're only on 20 seconds, maybe. And in an entire game, maybe you're on for a total of like two minutes, but the amount of preparation you have to put into that you have to be ready to go in any direction. So they just wanted to know that I could be prepared for the best game or a blowout and how I would handle that. Um, I'm trying to think, what else did they want to know? Uh, just my passion for baseball, my passion for Chicago. They wanted to know why Chicago, why the White Sox. Um, I think what excites me about Chicago is, uh, I think I got a question earlier about the fans. I mean, that's, for me, the biggest exciting part about Chicago because it doesn't really matter what the team is doing on the field. There is this built-in fan base that is so passionate and it's handed down from generation to generation that you're on the South side, you're a White Sox fan. And for me, that's what I connect to. And I respect that passion. And even if they can be hard, I understand because that's what sports is. Like things are never going to be perfect. Um, so I, I talked about just what excited me about Chicago and the White Sox and even just the, the young players. I mean, thinking about the fact that I could watch every single night, Luis Robert Jr. play and the way he can affect the game where they're at the plate or with his glove. I said, for me, that would be the biggest thrill because he could potentially be an MVP player one year. Do you think that was the selling point, what you just said to them? In terms of which, wow. what, what part of it? By, by, by talking about Luis Robert, the, your excitement about that. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure which part was the most selling part, but I was just trying to be real with them. I just like watching the baseball. And I think there are some really good pieces here. As of right now, Dylan Cease is going to be the opening day pitcher, right? Like, so there are some really great pieces for the White Sox. And for me, that's what excites me. How are we doing there? Good. Congratulations. Just so you, you just kind of stole my question a little bit, talking about Chicago. What is your most fondest memory of the city of Chicago? And how familiar are you with the city itself? So I've done uh, numerous events in and out of Chicago and I don't want to come off as like a phony, right? Like I don't know Chicago as well as a lot of people do. So what I want to do in terms of my broadcast style is let people know that I want to get ingrained in the community. I want to learn more about Chicago and I've invited people, Hey, hit me up. Like what are some good food spots? I have a dog. Like, tell me where are some cool places to take my dog? Like, what should I know about Chicago? And I think that's what I bring in the sense of, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I want people to teach me about the city so that I can become a local Chicago person because I'm going to be here for a while. That's the plan. We've signed a multi-year deal. This isn't like some stepping stone place. Like I am the Chicago White Sox play by play. Um, Herb, I need a drink. Uh, yeah. Let's take a break and we'll discuss what that was. Uh, Herb. Hello. Did you know that it's getting easier for businesses to switch to electric vehicles? It's something that we can all get behind for the health of the planet, for the well-being of all of us who share it. Yeah, the electric grid is evolving to meet your cleaner energy needs. As we all moved with confidence towards a new electric tomorrow, Sean, Vinny's favorite band. Good tune. Whether you have one delivery van 
or a whole fleet of shipping trucks. ComEd can help you guide you to make the changes that make sense. Herb, what your business owners do? Go to comed.com slash clean to learn more about resources, fleet rebates, and infrastructure incentives available to help businesses go electric. If you own a business, don't wait. Start making your plan today to switch to electric vehicles. Good for business, good for the planet, and good for all of us, Sean. Go to comed.com slash clean. Did you say comed.com slash clean? I did, Sean. Now, go there. And see how electric connects us all to a better way of doing business and a better future for generations to come. Thank you, Herb. And we want to let you know about our good friend. This is a new advertiser Ooh. on this podcast, so we want to make sure that we give them a, a nice CHGO White Sox welcome. They're, they've been a part of the CHGO family. Uh, Charlie the Bacon guy has oh. been more of a Hawks guy, uh, but now he's uh, got advertisement on this show, too. So welcome, Charlie. We're excited mm -hmm. to talk about your great product. Charlie the Bacon guy is based out of Woodridge, Illinois, and he makes craft bacon and bacon jams in over 35 mm. different flavors. The bacon and bacon jams are naturally cured, preservative-free products. They aren't any. There aren't any ingredients that Charlie can't pronounce himself involved in the process, unlike most store-bought bacon. It's vacuum-sealed and freezes perfectly. The bacon lasts in the package up to 60 days in the fridge one week after the seal is broken and nine months in the freezer the jam lasts about 90 days in the fridge and up to one year in the freezer and some of the favorites are maple pepper rosemary chorizo french toast korean barbecue jardinera ranch old bay some bacon jam flavors are original bourbon spicy the bacon jam goes perfect on anything like scrambled eggs toast crackers burgers grilled cheese some charcuterie boards or charlie's favorite right off the spoon. And you, starting right now, can save 10% on your order at charliethebakingguy.com when you use code CHGO at checkout. You can pick it up the most efficient way, or he will deliver it to you. I mean, you can meet halfway, or he can even ship it. He makes the bacon, so you can bring it home. You can contact him at charliethebakingguy.com, at charliethebakingguy on Instagram, at czthebakingguy on Twitter, and you can email him at charliethebakingguy at gmail.com. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so let's go to the comments real quick. Can we first go to Dave's comment? Because uh, it was funny. <laughs> uh, our guy John brings up, you know, all the calls that he likes hearing, you know, the shot heard around the world, uh, Red Barber's call. And he said, uh, you know, just the way that Red Barber described it. And Dave says, Red Barber had a, quote, say what you see, uh, close quote, approach because he was on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> I also want to go to Melissa oh, out of here God. because it's this is what I'm, yeah, it's up. This is what I'm right trying there. to remember. This is what I'm trying to think of when we're talking about somebody getting this type of job. Melissa says, I'm excited for him. He's been trying to live his dream. I'm more than happy to give him a chance to do that. We obviously played the Zoom. If you want to read more about John, you can go to allchgo.com and read Vinny Duber's pieces. He was obviously on that Zoom call, talked to John, and got his firsthand experience. And you could read Vinny's thoughts on John Schifrin over at allchgo.com. And that's the thing that I'm trying to remember. It's a tremendously positive comment from Melissa. Good job, Melissa. Uh, like Connor says, this is... You th as John said, his dream to be around Major League Baseball. He played college baseball. You assume that love is true. Yeah. And it's not John's fault that Brooks Boyer exists. And it's not John's fault, and it's not Brooks Boyer's fault, that Jerry <coughs> Reinsdorf is an extremely loyal person. I, well, I was kind of hesitant to even bring up the whole Jerry legacy thing with the whole stadium because it would be great to see a privately funded brand new stadium for Sox fans. Exactly. But everything else sucks. Oh, yeah. So, like, it's tough to kind of balance those scales because the whole John Schifrin thing, it took them 77 days to replace Jason Benetti. It took Jerry Reinsdorf 10 days to replace Rick Hahn. Uh, and Ken Williams. And as John said, uh, what was it exactly? Because I don't want to screw it up. Uh, uh, something about about White Sox fans and their passion. Uh, the, they might not always win or something along that line. Um, like it was just very much, it seems like Jerry Reinsdorf guy. He just likes good ball, good baseball. He just likes good baseball. He wants he's to see not good getting that. And he's going to see good baseball. I want to take a picture of John today. And then see what he looks like in next year. Barack Obama. Yeah, he's like. going to be president, uh, <laughs> aged like a president. I'm like, John, man, 
love the positivity, love that you got the new job. And I love that you're going into it with some positivity. That's excellent. You need that because these games you're going to be broadcasting. Look at the roster. It ain't going to be good baseball. Gavin Cheats going to be our right fielder. Mm. Gavin Cheats, yeah. And so it's going to be a little rough on you, John. If you're looking for good baseball, you might see it on the other side if they're playing the Guardians, the Twins, the Tigers, or the Royal, but not the White Sox. So great that he has this job. I am a big fan of somebody pursuing the goal that he wanted, and he's hit the goal that he wanted. Just and they that was a specific a, a question they asked him. It's like, hey, uh, what team did you grow up watching? And he was just giving play by play people instead of the actual team. I was thinking right. he's a New York guy who watched the Mets or the Yankees, but he didn't give that answer. So I, I think this hiring reminds me kind of of the Cubs hiring Boog Shambi. Now Boog Shambi had a profile, a name before he got to Wrigley Field as the club's play by play guy, but. To me, watching those games, Boog feels apart. He doesn't feel like he is a Cubs broadcaster. He feels like he is just a mercenary out there doing play-by-play. Well, because he's trained in the art of play-by-play, but it's not a Cub play-by-play guy. He won't go down, for me, as a one of the best Cub play-by-play guys. Lynn Casper, to me, even though he's a White Sox radio guy, was a Cubs play-by-play TV guy. Harry Carey, of course. Chip Carey. And for the White Sox, you got to kind of have that feeling that you're in with the fans. If you want to be in with the fans, be in with the fans. Move to the city, ingratiate yourself to what the city is all about, and know that they're, they're going to be hard as hell on this guy immediately. And Justin said, well, they were hard on Benetti. Little But Jason kind of had an end because he was a White Sox fan, born and raised here, and with the score people back in the day, they had credibility and credence. They lend it to him as Dan Bernstein, Lawrence Holmes, uh, Danny Parkins, all these people spoke up for him as, hey, this is a local guy. You're going to love him. Not that same uh, thing for John Schifrin because he's an outsider. We barely knew who he was before he was announced as the guy. And I know it shouldn't matter, but this is a provincial city. An outsider in this city usually doesn't work. They need our sports people to be ingratiated into the city and know about the team. Like, he won't know about the, the fight in 2000 versus the Tiger. He won't know about the things that why we have feelings towards certain teams and why this rivalry means a different thing, why they hate the Cubs, why Sox fans hate the Cubs for the most part. These things have to be felt and by White Sox people. And so I don't think he'll know and feel the rivalries and all the things that you need to know as a fan. Well, and two, like to add on to Melissa, because I feel like I'm going to say some negative stuff. So I want to just at least have a yin and yang thing. If you want to scroll up just a little bit, uh, Melissa says, uh, there's so much to be negative around this stupid team. Why not wish him well until he proves otherwise? Uh, you know, let's give him a chance because we haven't heard him call a major league baseball game. Mm-hmm. I don't know what a John Schifrin game sounds like. I have never heard him list or call a game. I, I cannot truly give my grade or review on how he sounds as a play-by-play announcer, how he does over nine innings. But when a group of media people who are trying to write stories on you have you for 20 minutes, and it seems like you could barely get 12 minutes of questions into the guy, like I just I don't know if we'll be sucked into a broadcast like we were with Jason, like people were with Hawk, like people were with Harry Carey. Like, I think for you to truly survive 162, you have to be a little bit more of a character. And it does seem, you use the word mercenary, like he is a mercenary. Um, It seemed very important for Jerry to get the right person. And John said this, they wanted to know, first off, my Hmm. commitment. That was a big thing off the bat. Obviously, I have a national platform with ESPN. They wanted to know what kind of commitment I was willing to make to the White Sox, and I said, I'm all in. If I'm the guy, I'm going to be all in. Right now, I plan on calling the majority of the games. We don't have an exact number, but I want to be the voice and face of the Chicago White Sox broadcast, and the goal is to be there throughout September. I guess... I guess they don't do the October broadcast. That's the whole Len Casper thing, is that he had to go to the radio to do that. All right, I'll be fair. Uh... Got to calm myself down. It was very clear, and that's something that I talked about with Jerry about very early on. 
whoever he hired, he wanted to make sure that the person this was going to be their main priority. And I said, I'm going to be very clear on that. That's the agreement we had very early on in this process. And that's the understanding that we have. Again, it's a very loyal person to Jerry Reinsdorf. I, I understand that he obviously has to praise the new boss. The yeah. guy gave him a job. The guy gave him a very rare opportunity. But again, Jason clearly had pushback with Brooks Boyer. Mm -hmm. And wasn't afraid to be his own person. Yes. Hawk was his own person and didn't say, you know, saved his Brooks Boyer's thoughts for once he retired. Um, but, you know, I mean, Hawk left the broadcast booth. Like, yeah. again, Hawk did things his own way. Harry Carey was drunk most of the time, right? I don't know if John has that grit. No. I, it I doesn't mean, seem like he does. I mean,. And I don't know if he's going to suck. That's the thing, Melissa. I'm not trying to say he's going to suck. I think I he's going to do a professional job. I think he's going to be very clean. Yeah. I think he's going to be very forgettable. And, and a professional job is, to me, like where you're kind of stiff. You're kind of, you know, just doing play-by-play one-on-one, which is fine. You know, tell me what you see. Cool. Fine. But the thing that made Jason and Steve must watch TV, even for a bad team, is because they kept it light. They kept it entertaining. They joked a little bit. And some people didn't like that. They're on a bad team covering 162. They need to do different things and have different stories ready for uh, the audience to consume. Now, John did say in there he was going to be like a point guard to Steve, just setting him up for oops and stuff like that. I hope he does. But also have your own stuff, John. You have a long history of broadcasting I think uh, broadcasting at Dartmouth as a player slash uh, broadcaster when you couldn't pitch anymore, you have a long history. You have a storied a family where your uh, grandfather was the, I think, the president of the NC, NC, NAACP of Philadelphia. You have a, a unique story of the second, only the second African-American play-by-play man in broadcast in uh, Major League Baseball with Dave Sims and Seattle. That is unique. You have a unique story. Introduce yourself. Do your thing. Don't try to be like Jason. Be yourself, but be calm, relaxed. Don't just try to be play-by-play -play guy. We got enough of that guy. Be yourself and tell us what you see, but also give us some personality. That's what I want. I don't want him to be a Jerry guy or a Brooks guy. I want him to be himself. If Jerry and Brooks don't like it after two years, they could say goodbye, but... Us fans would be like, hey, man, that guy did a great job. He wasn't one of those puppets that Jerry and Brooks want. He was his own person covering a bad team and doing a great job. I hope at the end of this he will be very well-liked and received. You're right. That was NCAAP uh, uh, president, also state legislator, uh, Alfonso Deal. Yes. Uh, styling and profiling Alfonso <laughs> Deal. I mean, he, yeah, he's looking good in the 70s. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, it'd be interesting to learn more about John. And, again, I think we've heard him speak for 13 minutes. I don't want to be too critical on such a very brief inter interaction. But what I'm just getting are sirens and red flags of this is a Jerry Reinsdorf guy and he doesn't have any ties to the city. All he has are ties to the people that gave him this job. Yes. Right. Like I, I'm just a little concerned about that. Um, yeah. And I get the, the pushback from some of you, AJ, Melissa, but it's a natural thing for me. I'm assuming Sean, when they hear that this is Brooks and Jerry's guy, like, no, no, it automatically push back because of those two people and their terrible hiring history. And Brooks, I don't like look at all the people outside the door when they hit outside the door, have something bad to say about Brooks. Like these things are going to happen because it seems like the guy has got too much power and too much influence in the broadcasting and he should be just chilling out, chilling about talking about marketing and such like that. <laughs> <laughs> talking about Notre Dame football. Yeah. Um, AJ said, I don't think it's totally fair to continue spe uh, to speculate negatively about him based off a short interview. That dude was probably nervous as hell and terrified to say the wrong thing. But that's the thing is I don't think he was nervous because he's very professional. He's very prepared. So that's why, again, I think it's going to be a fine broadcast. I just think that we saw so much dynamic energy coming from Steve and Jason as they built up throughout the years. And I don't know if they'll have that same pop. 
I haven't heard a single game. Again, I, I obviously am trying to realize what, what, what I'm saying and how little of information we have on this person. Welcome to Chicago, John. We hope it obviously goes well. I don't want to do like a John Schiffer and leave Chicago after a year podcast. Like that would suck. Uh, but in, maybe it's a little bit of da- what Dave is saying. Nothing about that Zoom has me excited about hanging out with John every night for a season. Maybe I'm projecting a lack of enthusiasm for this team on him. Again, maybe we just hate knowing that John Schiffer is going to be calling Paul DeYoung feeling a ground out every night. Yeah. I think that he is an extension of the fans. And so for him to come in here as a Jerry slash Brooks guy, then that's it without any White Sox history. It's kind of troubling. But yes, as you guys say, we'll give him a chance when he hears, like we might even have him on eventually and talk to him and, and tell him to his face or via video. Hey man, be yourself, man. Don't, don't even be messing with that Jerry Brooks stuff. Be yourself. Cause your legacy is past the White Sox. They'll be putting your name on, your own legacy, not Jerry and Brooks. You won't be part of theirs. So be yourself and win or lose this job because you were good or bad at it, not because they told you to do a certain style. Right. I, Just the contract signed. The ink is dried. If they got fire you, you still get paid. I don't know what an entire game will sound like, and it's it's pretty unfair to like base him off of just highlights too. Like It, it seems like, hey, he can – Yell, um, like oh, you yeah, know, watch I mean, a couple of games, man. Brug is <laughs> Brug is excited. Yeah, right. I don't like, know how to get excited in baseball, but that one time he was yelling about a home run, it was it was kind of weird to me. I didn't see that one. Uh, he, I just I just saw it was that. a college baseball game, and he had said something. Um, I forgot his tagline, but I hope he doesn't bring it to Chicago. I gotta watch it again. He got hyped about a ball just getting rocked, which is great, yeah. but it was. Like, I liked it here. It was up here. It was uh, Eric Collins. You know Eric Collins from the Charlotte Hornets? Um, the play-by-play for the Charlotte oh, Hornets? okay, okay. Like, he's always extra hyped. Or Gus Johnson. It right. was of that level. So, if you like Gus Johnson type extra hype, you're going to like John Schifrin. I like Gus Johnson, though. But it's because I like energy as a national broadcaster. Like, Gus feels unique to national broadcasters. Yes. I, I, I again, I don't know if he's going to suck. I haven't heard a single game from him. I just don't know if he's going to be that unique, which, again, I think we've had the last three play-by-play announcers have been extremely unique in their own right. And I think, you know, it's it's hard to see that with John right now. Let's take a break, and uh, let's uh, let you know about our friends over in Las Vegas. Uh, and now they're in Illinois. Our friends, Circa, uh, have launched in Illinois. So you can download the Circa Sports Illinois app at circasports.com slash Illinois app. That's circasports.com slash Illinois app. They are the world's largest sports book, and you could download the app and have it at your fingertips. The best part about Circa, there are real people behind the Circa brand who resolve issues in a timely fashion, unlike other books who use chat box. And all aspects of the app are being run by the same team that run the main Circa sports book at Circa Resort in Long. Las Vegas, and plus, you have real people who can help you, and Circa does not limit players based on their winnings. Every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players. So if you are looking for the the best price on Chiefs plus four or Lions plus seven, download Circa Sports and check out our friends over at Circa Sports dot com slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. Also be on the lookout for Circa events, watch parties and tailgates. If you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-GAMBLER, 1-800-426-2537. Text GMB833234. Visit com. And we want to let you know about our friends over at Chevy. Our partner, Ray Chevrolet, is ringing in the new year with their best offers all month long. Make your way to Ray Chevrolet on Route 12 in Fox Lake to join in on the savings and start your Ray resolution. As one of the top-selling Chevy dealers in the Midwest, you'll always be able to shop one of Chicagoland's largest Chevy inventories. But right now, they're trying to make room for inbound 2024 models, so all of their current inventory must go. Uh, Plus, what? No. Oh. We could, you, want to, you want to try that again? Yeah. Must go. No. Okay, cool. Uh, plus, you can find the perfect tailgating vehicle at Ray Chevy because they have over 100 new Silverados available with prices starting at $19,495 or take up to $10,000 off a new 2023 Silverado. And to top it all off, they're pricing over 125 vehicles under $20,000. Seriously, can pricing get more affordable? And there's nothing more affordable than the world 
word free and get a free oil change. If you mention CHGO when scheduling your oil change at Ray Chevrolet and Fox Lake, start your new year off right. Visit Ray Chevrolet and Fox Lake or RayChevrolet.com to start your Ray resolution. They've been serving the, serving the community since 1963. Find new roads. Um, to just hammer on the point, again, it did seem like, as Jim Margulis put, uh, the main takeaway from the John Schifrin introduction is that Jerry Reinsdorf showed more interest who was broadcasting the games than who was building the teams. Uh, again, 10 days to hire Chris Getz when I think he knew who he was hiring once he fired Rick and Ken, uh, and 77 days to find John Schifrin. I, again, hope that he has a really successful time in Chicago. I hope he gets to see 40 home runs from Luis Robert. He gets to see that opening day start from Dylan Cease. I just don't know what it's going to feel like in September when we will be watching these games mm -hmm. for post game shows. Like we, the only reason why I think I care this much is because literally it is my job to watch this. Yes. It is my job to take in what John Schifrin is going to be saying. And I, that's, I guess the big reason why I can't just let it happen. And I know Melissa and most of these people in the chat like us uh, are diehards. So they're also watching 162 games of John Schifrin. Mm -hmm. And I just, I have my own, my own qualms. But hey, you know, maybe he's like a, a crazy dog trainer. Maybe his dog can do flips. I don't know, man. I mean, if he only concentrates, what, his dog and food? Dog and food. I, I mean, he's going to have a good time in Chicago. This, this town is a dog town and definitely 100% a food town. And when you suggest a food place, people, as I know we're South Sider and we cover South Side stuff, make it past and south of Roosevelt Road, please. That, that's the one thing I hate. Oh, here's the best restaurants in Chicago, and they're all downtown or Wrigleyville. It's like there's places on the South Side, guys. Hyde Park, Bronzeville, hell, uh, Mount Greenwood, Beverly, right there in uh, Armor Square, Chinatown, Jimmy's Red Hots. Look at my guy over there, uh, the Cub guy, Ryan Herrera, just saying Jimmy's Red Tots. That's what I want. When you suggest a place for the man, don't just say these garbage-ass north side places as a north sider now. I get mad at that. Well, I, I mean, there's good places in Chicago. I mean, there's 77 neighborhoods. I feel like we yeah, should. Yeah, we only covered like 35 of them. <laughs> Ugh, south side, my car doesn't go down there. Um, maybe that's what we should do. Instead hmm. of having him on the podcast. Just take him out to a, a place? take him out to eat. Hey, you know, hey. take him to Vito and Nick's. Hey. Take him to Palermo's. I'm down. You know me. You guys like Palermo's when we went. I love Palermo's. Will we go to the 95th one or do I go to the 63rd one, which I keep on hearing about? Well, 95th is good, but 63rd is the real one. Never been to the 63rd that's one. That's what people keep on telling me. Yeah. And that's exactly how they sign when they say it to me. Um, hey, if you guys are going to invite me out to the Palermo's on 63rd, I'll love to go. I don't know if John Schifrin has time with his busy schedule of doing ESPN college basketball games if he can do it but during the season living in vegas oh yeah exactly and during the season hell yeah we'll go out to the south and eat some food we'll start a whole like thing like sean herb and Vinny's food reviews on the south side um and connor does bring up that there were no sock ties or white sock ties for hawk uh he was hired his hire coincided with reinsdorf purchasing the team reinsdorf seemed to perform former players as broadcaster for years um but I Hawk guess is a personality. Like, right. Like the thing is, is that like the point that I was trying to make is I don't know what makes John Schifrin uniquely himself. He seems extremely professional. His yes. background screams professional. He was a reporter. He's trying to build relationships, not get things wrong, not rock the boat. He went to a gifted school, not trying to say that judgmentally, but like he went to a gifted school in New York. Like he has been, I think, very proper throughout yes. his life. I don't want somebody proper for 162. No, oh, take that tie off. Just wear a, a regular sweater, quarter zip, chill out, some uh, sweatpants. Don't be all right. stiff in the booth. And uh, three and two, here's the pitch. That ball has hit the shortstop. That shortstop picks it up and throws it to first base. What a throw by Paul DeYoung. That's an excellent <laughs> job. There, the pitcher gets it back. Ring a ding ding. No. <laughs> I want him dead. to be relaxed, chill out. Yeah. You know? And some of these calls, man. He gets up. So get, bring that to me. 
John Schifrin. Bring those football, those UFL uh, calls you bring when you get really excited. Well, and that's the thing too. Like, what if what if there's just no highlights? I mean, I mean, <laughs> like, Luis Roberts gonna have some highlights, and if this man's healthy, as he told AJ and the boys down at a uh, foul territory, if Aloy's healthy, he'll, he'll forty home 40. runs is uh, right. the bottom. Oh, it's man. the the floor. He gonna hit more than forty home runs, so there's gonna be some John Schifrin excitement for Eloy Jimenez. A lot of high moms in the dugout too. Thank you to Kevin Bryant for the or Bryant. Uh, let me make sure I'm hitting that because you know I learned this in uh, in Jeopardy. Like if you say like if I said Kevin Bryant because I didn't wrong. hit the T, it would be wrong because yes. it's yeah. So I just, just want to like, make sure that I'm same thing in Wheel right. of Fortune. I'm a Wheel of Fortune guy. Uh, super chat ten dollars from Kevin Bryant. Uh, the only thing that matters is John Schifrin's home run call. I want him calling a Paul DeYoung dinger like Jerry the King Lawler. <laughs> 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 I believe Connor is doing that by saying the casket's on fire. The casket's <laughs> on fire. Um, yeah, like we have a Jim Ross oh, call. No! Like, oh <laughs> God, he killed that baseball. <laughs> Oh, my God. If John Schifrin's like that, I would absolutely love him. But, yeah, we're going to let him be himself. But A little could, jo- Joey Styles. Oh, my God. <laughs> he killed that baseball. We can have a little trepidation about the new guy, especially after our guy was so good now in goddamn Detroit. Oh, right. Like Let Detroit get everything. Goddamn Michigan wins the national championship. The Lions are in the NFC championship. Now they got our damn guy up there in Tiger. You. Tiger Lane. You're, you're like, well, and Jackie, too. Like she said, to your point, uh, Sox fans are war torn, so it'd be nice if he had a little edge. Like, it felt like, especially after last season, Jason was on our side. Yes. Like, Jason knew that he couldn't bring an agent to uh, negotiate with Jerry and Bo- Brooks. Like, he saw the way that the sausage was made, and it didn't vibe with him. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't also want John Schifrin to go in being like, Jerry Reinsdorf's going to be so loyal, and then, you know, five years from now, he's screwing you and you're going to fucking Minnesota. Like, I I don't know what to expect from John Schifrin at all. So I, I maybe that, I, I, I want to make that clear. I don't Being like, a new guy is hard. Yeah. This is definitely a tough situation. It's a very, very uh, elite and unique and rare situation situation to get so like this might be a once in a lifetime opportunity so obviously there might be nerves involved with that yeah jason went stericus but he's from here and jason kind of relaxed jason was as i said before was brought in and people vouched for his for his uh bona fides this guy doesn't have that but the thing i don't like is the white Sox kind of didn't learn their lesson white Sox fans were pissed that J- uh, jason benetti went away because of the reason why he went away is the White Sox didn't want him to be doing very minimal, what, Saturday and Sunday games away from the White Sox. This guy seems like he's going to be doing kind of the same thing. He's at a majority of the games, a majority of 162. I know you're the math guy, but I just did it in my head, is 82. So he could do anywhere from 82 to 162. It wasn't an actual number he's going to be doing every mm-hmm. game. So... Like, they didn't learn their lesson. That's their most important thing is, hey, you're going to be loyal to the White Sox. You're not going to be going to further your brand, which also furthers our brand, on a national broadcast. It's just the dumbest, short-sighted way of thinking and hiring for somebody. You want your people that you hire to be stars. That's good for you, idiots. God, I... I that's why... Mar- stay in marketing, Brooks. God damn. Well, how do you not know about your brand being elevated by your guy going to national things? And I, I, to Beef Loaf's point, where he says Jason went to Syracuse, which is broadcaster, you got you, and you guys are worried about <laughs> this this guy's pedigree being too stiff. It's just that again, I don't think that he has comfortability here. I don't think that he has something to rely on. Jason had friends. Jason was from here. Jason knew the town. Jason knew the team. Jason watched the team growing up and hey I, I don't remember Jason's first year he could have been stiff because what he was like 24 he was like he was like tw- <laughs> he's like he was a little older 31 now. like yeah. I mean he was he was extremely young I mean like at least eight years younger than what Schifrin's at so I don't think that Schifrin has the comfortability built in to Chicago like Jason had so I think there's going to be a different time or a difficult transition period for Schifrin compared to Benetti. And I also think that Jason has kind of 
realized, and maybe John will realize this throughout his broadcasting journey and career, I think Jason realized who he was yeah. in the White Sox broadcast, and now we see Jason Benetti be truly Jason Benetti, whether it be calling a White Sox game, a Fox football game, a Fox basketball game. I don't know Schifrin. We haven't really met him yet, so we'll see. I wish you luck, Johnny. We'll see. My um, brother. Yeah. And he went to Howard University, too. Let's go. Did he? Yeah. I thought he went to Dartmouth. He went to Dartmouth and Howard. I think he went to Howard for a broadcast. Fucking degrees is he at? This man's smart. Jesus Christ. Out here. All right. Um, anyway, Chocolate City. That's going to do it for uh, the CHGO White Sox podcast. Uh, anything else that we needed to mention with this? Um, Vinny's article at allchgo.com. Uh, we will be posting the full Schifrin Zoom on our YouTube channel as well. Vinny will be back tomorrow with a report on what happened with the Boys and Girls Club event uh, and hopefully a report on how swole Andrew Benatendi is. So we'll see. And hopefully one of these days. I mean, keep on talking to Nicky Lopez via DMs. You know, he had a, a death in his family. His dog had passed, so he really couldn't do it yesterday. So one of these days... We're going to get Naperville's finest, Nikki Lopez, on the show. Damn it. All right. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him at Eckerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Uh, and thank you to Sarah for producing the show. And thank you to everyone for hanging out with us. Hit up the thumbs up button, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 3.30. We're all silly like the mayor. 